Get your Bible open to Romans chapter 1. This is probably, out of all the lessons we've done so far, my favorite to teach. And some of the things you'll hear tonight you have heard before, some of them a few different times. But that is good to have that repetition. So let's go to Romans 1. I'll read a verse to kick us off, and then we will literally take off here. and I'll have some fun with this tonight. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans 1, 20. If you ever have anybody ask you the question, what about the people who have never heard the gospel? What does God do with them? Well, Romans 1 answers that question. And actually, I'll, I'll read verse 19. That's not what we're talking about tonight, but I'll read it. And then along with verse 20, it'll help. And you get the idea of what happens to people who have never heard the gospel. It says in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest where? Notice it says in them, for God hath showed it unto them. And then the next verse, for the invisible things of him. From the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Excuse, in a nutshell, people who maybe have never had a preacher tell them what Jesus Christ did for them, they don't have an excuse. Does anybody know why, according to what the Bible says right here? What did God give them? Anybody? The creation. And the lesson tonight is on the creation being a testimony of who God is and how by studying God's creation, you can learn all sorts of spiritual truth just by looking at what God made and then looking at what the Bible says about those things that God made. So that's, that's the answer to that age old question. What about the heathen who've never heard of God's actually showed them some things with his creation. So let's pray together and then we'll dive in here tonight. Lord, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to teach your word. And I just pray that this lesson tonight is understood by all who hear. May we go away from here in search of things all over your creation that we can learn spiritual truth from. May our eyes be open tonight by your Holy spirit to be more observant of the world you made around us and to search out the scriptures for how you will put light on the scriptures by just us studying the creation. And I pray that again, you have your way. We'd have understanding. We'd have application be made here this week in all of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. All right, I want you to know something about verse 20. Every time I read this verse, it's a little bit mysterious until you read the whole thing. Notice the verse part of verse 20. It says for the invisible things, Let's make sure we define what invisible things are. Invisible things are things that you cannot, you can't see them. If you could see them, they would not be invisible. Invisible things are things unseen. You can't see them. Keep reading though. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen. Do you know what the first half of that verse told you and me? The invisible things of God actually can be clearly seen. What are we talking about? First off, let's make sure we understand what invisible things we're talking about. There is a spiritual world all around me and you. Did you know that? You do not see it with your physical eyes. That does not mean it does not exist. You do see the influence on people in the physical realm from the spiritual realm by what they say, by their attitudes, by their actions. You see this at church. You see this at your place of work. You see this in the grocery store. People are influenced by the spiritual realm. Sometimes that's the Lord. Sometimes that's Satan. There is a spiritual world. And the Lord wants us to know some things about the spiritual world, but he, he chose not to give us spiritual glasses to see everything as he would. At the same time, he has given us a glimpse into that world. And here's how. Right after verse 20, it says, are clearly seen. It gives you more insight. It says, being understood by what? 
the things that are made. And then it goes on to say this, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they were without excuse. So let me give you the first couple blanks here. I have under the verse a statement. How is it that the invisible, when I say invisible, I'm talking about spiritual things. How is it that those spiritual things can be clearly seen? I'll give you the answer here. First dot, first bullet point. By understanding the things that God made his physical creation. Okay, so we got to make sure we differentiate. And if you were here for the pie social we had here a few weeks back, we talked. <laughs> Amen, brother. We talked about how you need to learn to differentiate between the things that are man-made and God-made. And I'm looking around this room and there is not much in here besides me and you that was made by God. I mean, you look at the pews, the walls, the lights, all these things are man-made, right? And I'm not saying they're bad. I thank the Lord that he gave men the ability to make some things that are helpful. But differentiate between what God made and what man made. And here's why. When you study the things that God made, there are spiritual lessons to be learned. So let me move on here. God uses his creation to teach us spiritual truth. So that next blank on that second bullet point, God uses his creation to teach us spiritual truth. So uh, this year I'm, I'm actually uh, not teaching a science class. I teach a, another class at my school, but for years I taught science and the Lord I was not a science major coming up through school. I majored in health and physical education. Then I had a whole bunch of hours in biology. So I actually got my certification in biology and I started teaching biology. And the Lord had me do that on purpose because he had a whole lot to teach me about this very subject tonight. And I had a blast all those years teaching biology because what I was able to do on a regular basis is show the kids how, yeah, you're studying this particular animal or this particular plant. And that's in the physical realm. But guess what? There's something to learn about that plant or animal spiritually. So let's go to the Bible and see what God said about that. Let me give you a classic example. Proverbs uses a little tiny animal to teach you work ethic. What animal is that? Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider the ways of the ant and be wise. You can study that little ant and you find out that that little ant is a worker. That little ant is not lazy. And that ant's life depends on being a laborer. Okay, what do you and I learn from that? We watch that little ant and I know you've all done it. You've messed up the ant pile with your foot. And what happens? Thousands of little ants go to work. And they go to work to restore that thing that you messed up with your foot in three seconds. And it takes them some time, takes them quite a long time, but they all work. How, how do they work? All those ants work how? Together to put that thing back together. The ant is a worker. That's one ant. But then you put a bunch of ants together, working together, they can do something great. What did God teach us using the ant? About work ethic and about teamwork. A little, God uses the, the most unusual things. The Bible calls them, God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the things that are mighty and that little ant, there's a treasure trove of spiritual truth to learn by studying that ant more about the ant later on. Go to Psalm 19. That's just one example. I'll give you a whole bunch of examples here tonight. The study of science from a Christian, from a biblical perspective is the study of God's power and majesty and also a glimpse into the spiritual realm. So Psalm 19, this is such a neat chapter, and I'm going to actually read several verses because I want to show you how God broke this chapter into, there's actually three divisions, I'm only going to show you two tonight, but he broke it up into two divisions and the verses we'll read on purpose to show us something really neat. So look at verse one, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Okay, now, English grammar. This is where you got to help get that. It'll be real helpful if you know a little bit about grammar. Verse 3. 
it says there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. There is a pronoun. Who does there refer to in the passage? Anybody? Say again. Close. No, no, it's right there in the passage. What's the first thing mentioned in verse 1? The heavens. That's the topic. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, shall and show the work. Day and day utter speech. Night and night showeth knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. God uses the heavens to preach the gospel. You say, come on. I'm saying, oh, yes. What happens... <laughs> Here we are, it's 6.30. What's already happened tonight that at this time last week was just happening? The sun's gone down. And when the sun goes down, it's dark. But the sun doesn't stay down. In the morning, what's the sun do? What's the sun do? It rises. No coincidence we use that terminology. Then tomorrow night, the sun's going to go down. And it's going to be dark. And then the sun's going to what? Rise. Now... Where I live, we see this a lot. We, we look over to the west from our condo over in Vieira, and I look over there often and see the sun going down, and guess what color the sky is? Different shades, but red. And sometimes it's a dark red, sometimes it's lighter red, but often I see a red, red portion of the sky. And what might God be doing when he puts that red in the sky and the sun goes down? And then it's dark, and then the next morning, that sun rises again. You know what God's doing every 24 hours? He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the gospel with his creation. Because what happened a couple thousand years ago? The sun went down, S-O-N. And what'd they do with him after he died? They put him in a grave where it's dark. But he didn't stay in the grave. What happened? He rose again. God put the gospel in the sky every day you've ever been alive. It's there every 24-hour cycle. God put the death, burial, and resurrection in his creation, a picture of it. He put it there for you to see every day. Isn't that something? God teaches spiritual truth through the physical things, the creation that he made. Okay, I, I, I didn't mean to go off on that, but man, I, I can't. I just have to say that. Verse 4. Their line, the heavens, their line has gone out through all the earth. And their words, the heavens speak their words to the end of the world. In them, in the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Now notice this. The sun. God is going to tell you something about the sun so you can learn about his son. Look what verse 5 says. This is so neat. Which is as... Keyword, as a what? A bridegroom. That's a male, right? A bridegroom. The S-U-N is likened to a bridegroom. Notice what else it says. A bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a what kind of man? Strong man to run a race. You know what God's telling you there? He says, when you look at that sun up in the sky... You are to be reminded of my son, S-O-N, the son, the son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the bridegroom. Who's he marrying, by the way? Who's he marrying? A bridegroom has a bride. The church is his bride. And what kind of man is Jesus Christ described right there in verse 5? He's, a, he's not a weak man. He's a strong man. Man, I tell you, there, there's something about studying the sun. You know, what stu you know what sun is? It's a giant fireball. It'll hurt you if you get too close to it. But it'll warm you and comfort you if you have the right distance from it. Isn't that how the Lord Jesus Christ is? He's either your savior or he's your judge. Isn't that how the sun could be, depending on how close you are or far away to the sun, the S-U-N? I tell you, God's put all kinds of truth about Jesus Christ if you just study that S-U-N up in the sky, uh, we're going to get to this in Sunday school here probably uh, the next time. The light in John chapter 1, it's got a capital L on it. And Jesus Christ is called the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What physical light has God put up in the sky that lights every person who's ever lived on planet Earth? It's the S-U-N. You want to learn about Jesus Christ? 
You could spend time studying the S-U-N and draw all kinds of parallels spiritually to Jesus Christ. And I tell you, I, I want to I wanna just launch out right now and do that, that message, but I'm going to save it for another time. We'll just have to have a message on the sun one of these days. There's a bunch of neat stuff about that. Let's go on here. Verse 6, his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. Notice the he, the, the, the masculine there referring to the S-U-N. His circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Okay, so that's pretty neat. All about God's physical creation in the first six verses. Watch the Holy Spirit change gears in verse 7. The, what's that next word? Law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, speaking about God's words, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. The Holy Spirit of God changed gears from verse 7 down to verse 11, and he went from talking about the physical creation to... The word of God, he says law, he says statutes, he says judgments, testimonies, commandments, all synonyms for what you've got in your lap tonight. God's words. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Lord laid that chapter out like that. He starts off talking about his creation. Then he goes and changes gears talking about his word. So here's what you need to write down. Psalm 19, 1 through 11, verses 1 through 6. God's creation. Verses 7 through 11, God's words. Now, here's a statement that I love. And teaching science in Christian school, man, this is the neatest thing to do. The creation is God's classroom. Every teacher needs a classroom, right? God's creation is his classroom. He wants to teach you. If you would observe his creation, he will. But you also need, every good teacher needs a textbook, right? You need something to kind of guide you as you go with an organized plan. So the Bible is God's textbook. There you go. The creation is God's classroom. The Bible is God's textbook. So if you are here this evening, and this is everybody here, you're all blessed with a set of eyes. Now, I need glasses. I can't really see. If I had to read something on the back row there, I probably couldn't read it, even if it was big letters. I need a little help, but I can still see. For the most part, so can you all. Maybe you need glasses, contacts. You have the ability to see things physically. You also have the ability to read God's word. If you are blessed with the ability to observe God's creation and read God's word, you have a treasure chest of truth awaiting you to learn. So let's see if we can put all this together. First thing I got here is patterns in God's creation that teach spiritual truth. God has placed, and I'm just going to focus on one particular pattern tonight. Patterns in God's creation teach spiritual truth. So here's what I wrote down. God has stamped his identity all over his creation. Have you ever observed how so many things are divided into threes? There's your blank, threes. It is no accident. Now, before we launch out into this, go to 1 John 5, verse 7. 1 John 5. Now that first verse we started off with tonight in Romans 1, it mentioned the word Godhead. Now we often use the word Trinity, and it means the same thing as Godhead. Trinity's not in the Bible. The word Godhead is. So anybody want to take a wild guess at how many times in the Bible the word Godhead shows up? You only get one guess. Anybody? Three times, yes. You see it in Acts. You see it one time in Romans and one time in Colossians. And that's it. I believe God did that on purpose. Now, if you don't know what the Godhead is, let's look at 1 John 5. And he lays it out real clear. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, there's one. The Word, if you're here for Sunday school, you know who that is. Who's the Word? That's Jesus Christ, also known as the Son. The Father, the Word, there's two, and the Holy Ghost. And notice what the last part of the verse says. And these three are what? 
One, so God, on purpose, when he made this universe, put so many things that naturally are one thing, but have three separate parts. We could spend until midnight thinking about this, but we're only going to spend a couple of minutes, all right? This is food for thought for the rest of the week. What I put down here is illustrations, the bold face there, illustrations of the Godhead are seen all over God's creation. God has put his stamp. He is one God, but he is also three persons, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He's put his stamp all over his creation. So the first one I have here, I put blank is spirit, soul, and body. Anybody want to guess what that is? That's you, man. First Thessalonians 5.23 says, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. So if you did not know this, you are made of three parts. Did you know that? I'm looking at one part right now and only one part. You're only looking at one part when you look at me. You see the body. You know what the body is? It's a temporary casing. It's very temporary. It only lasts so long. Don't invest all your life into your body because it's not worth the investment for only a few years. When you look at it, 70, 80, 90 years, if you're blessed. So what else do you have besides a body? You have a soul. What else do you have besides a soul? You got a spirit. Now, if you're saved, you don't have a dead spirit. You got a living spirit. You got the Holy Spirit living in you, right? But the spirit of man is dead as a hammer. Spirit of man is set on earthly, worldly things and is of no use. So you are three parts. Now, you remember over there in Genesis, it says God made man in his own image. God certainly did. He, he patterned man after himself. God is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. God has a body. Who's God in bodily form? Jesus Christ. God has a soul. That would be God eternally. Who is he? God the Father. God, God has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. You see that? So God made man in his own image in that. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, body, soul, spirit. That does not mean that you don't need to be saved because of that spirit. There's a problem. That's Adam and Eve brought that into this world with the spirit. They died spiritually on the day they sinned. Okay, so how about the next one? Take you back to science class. There are three states of... Matter, liquid, solid, gas. Now, the classic example here is this substance that you all need, we all need, called H2O. I drank a lot of H2O today. I'm on this campaign to drink a lot of water, and man, it sure does make you feel good if you drink a lot of water. Half a gallon to stay alive, a gallon to thrive. Uh, you need water. So water in liquid form, we call it water, right? What's water in solid form? Ice. What's water, H2O, in gaseous form? Steam, water vapor. Is water vapor H2O? Is ice H2O? Is the water that you drink out of the bottle of the glass H2O? It's the same substance. Three different forms. What a great illustration of the identity of God himself. He's one, but three. And they're different, but they're the same. Very unique. God just put that out there for us. How about the next one? Science class. What has three parts, a proton, neutron, and electron? An atom, an atom. A cell, the next one is a cell. Now I know there's a bunch of parts to a cell, but I've taught out of a number of different science books and they all nail down three main parts. The cell membrane, that's the outer part of it. The cytoplasm, that's the inward part that kind of holds everything together. And then the brain of the cell, which is called the nucleus. So it's funny that the kids always throw at me, they say, but Mr. Rockwell, Plant cells have this thing around them called a cell wall. And I say, exactly. Not all cells, only plant cells. But all cells have those three parts. Some cells have something around that outermost called a cell wall. So they all have three. Some have more than three main parts. The next one, head, thorax, abdomen. Anybody know what that is? Three parts of a, an insect. An insect has head, thorax, abdomen. You know the next one, three aspects, past, present, future, time. Folks, the list is endless. Uh, early on when I started teaching, 
I had just the kids in my class compile this list and it went on pages and pages and pages of things in God's creation that are naturally broken down into three parts. God did that on purpose because he made this universe so that when you looked at it, you would say, there must be a God, then say, there must be something connected with three and the God who made all this. And you're right. You get into the Bible and he explains all that for you. But just observing the creation, you get that truth about there's got to be a God and there's got to be something about the number three in connection with him. Now, the last one here, we'll go real deep here in biology here. Part of you, this is actually part of something that's inside of you. It has erythrocytes, also known as red blood cells, leukocytes, also known as white blood cells, and thrombocytes, also known as platelets. Anybody know what I'm talking about? What is it, Miss Katie? Anybody? It's your blood. Now, blood is made up of a liquid portion called plasma, but those three parts are the solid particles in blood. Red blood cells carry oxygen. White blood cells fight off infection. Uh, platelets are the things that keep you from bleeding to death whenever you get a cut or a scrape. You need all three of those things, don't you? I'm telling you, a study of what God made will make you in awe of your creator. I cannot understand. Uh, I do because the Bible tells you, but it's, it's just really hard to wrap your brain around sometimes how doctors and scientists with PhD after PhD and MD after MD, all these degrees, they can't, they won't, I should say, they won't acknowledge the Lord God Almighty as a creator. And they're studying things that he made every day. Isn't that something? It's a sad state of our world. Okay, let's move on here. God has patterns. Patterns teach spiritual truth. The next thing, non-living things in God's creation teach spiritual truth. Okay, so the first thing I have here, I'll give you the blanks and then we'll look at them. Weather and climate are used by God to teach his truth. Weather and climate. Now, isn't it by no coincidence that what's on everybody's mind today, thanks to the stinking rotten news. You're supposed to be in fear right now. Did you know that? Watch out. There's a hurricane in November or a potential hurricane. Therefore, there must be climate change occurring. And uh, Brother Bob was telling me, yeah, in the year 2100, we're going to be in trouble. Aren't you, aren't you really worried? <laughs> 2100, it's such a, such a long ways away. I, I, don't, I don't know how much we need to be concerned about that right now, but weather and climate. So let's go over to Genesis and I'll give you this first thing here. Now, you know this one already, but I'll just prove it to you. Genesis 7. Weather and climate are things used by God to teach spiritual truth. So the first thing I have in here is a rainstorm. What does God teach us with the rainstorm? particularly a rainstorm of the magnitude you're going to see here in Genesis 7. Look at verse 4. 7, 4. This is God telling Noah. Genesis 7, 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to do what? Rain upon the earth. 40 days and 40 nights. And every living substance that I have made, will I what? Destroy from off the face of the earth. You go back to Genesis 6. It says the whole, the whole earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. You know why God sent that rain? What was the purpose of the first rain? God, God was sending judgment on this world. So what you need to write down there, rainstorm, picture of God's judgment. Now, those of you who've been here on Wednesday night, here a few weeks back, we hit this one. Go to Genesis 19. Watch the wording over here. When things fall from the sky sent by God, you better watch out. It's often God's judgment. Look at 1924. Rain, a picture of God's judgment. I wonder what the climate change experts would have thought about this if they'd have been alive. Look at 1924. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice the word rained. What did he rain? Brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew up on the ground. Folks, when God sends a big storm like that, that is a picture of his judgment. Now, I'm not making light of this. I'm just showing you how God does this. Very recently here, there was a hurricane and there were people in our state that died, right? Now, every soul that dies is important. Every person that ever lives is important. 
But what I'm telling you is that when you see a storm and there's death involved, it should be a reminder of how God does judge. Now, I'm not saying that God was judging Fort Myers. He could have been. I, I'm not going to try to say he was or not. Or New Orleans, whenever he sent Katrina. I mean, they, we could go on and on. Or even Brevard County over the years. What I am saying is every time you see a violent rainstorm, it ought to remind you and me of what? God is a God that judges sin. That's a reminder there, okay? Do you notice when there's a violent rainstorm with a lot of wind and rain, there are things that are destroyed that are not repairable. Reminder, God does judge. That's, that's what makes him who he is. Okay, let's go to the next one on the back. The whirlwind. The whirlwind. Go to Job 38. I'll turn over there and then we'll, I'll give you this one. Job 38. What is the whirlwind? Well, a whirlwind could be tornado, could be hurricane, cyclone, any of those things. And have you ever noticed a whirlwind is very powerful, yet it is invisible. Now, I did this during the last hurricane only for a minute, maybe, and the wind was not that bad. I stood outside. And I actually was at school trying to get some things taken down, and I waited too long. I should have done it the day before, but I didn't. So I was taking some things down so they wouldn't be, be damaged. And in that time of taking things down, the Lord gave me a little time where there was no rain, but there was some powerful wind. And I was just about knocked down by a gust. So here's what I'm doing. I'm standing there. And if somebody would have been, had a video camera out, they would have seen this fella fall over or almost fall over. And there's nobody there pushing him. What was, what was pushing me down? The wind. Something that is completely invisible was throwing me down or about to. Reminder, God, you can't see him, but that doesn't mean he's not powerful. And the wind is a great picture of the presence of God. Look at Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of what? The whirlwind. Go to chapter 40. You see this again. God does it again. Chapter 40, verse 6. Job 40, verse 6. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind. And he speaks there. So the first thing I have here, the whirlwind is a picture of the presence of God. In the book of Job, when that whirlwind shows up, God's right there and he speaks out of the whirlwind. So it's the presence of God. The next one here is really neat. Go to Proverbs 1. I'll show you these two in Proverbs. I have to save the one for Jeremiah for time. You'll have to look at that one on your own. Go to Proverbs 1. What else can the whirlwind teach us? Number one, the presence of God. So anytime there's a big wind, wind storm or wind accompanying rain, be reminded God is invisible, yet he is powerful, just like that wind. Look at Proverbs 1, verse 27. This is actually about people who have rejected God and then they decide, oh, I want to get serious. I need the Lord, but it's too late. Look at verse 26, actually. The Lord says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction, notice it, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you. Go to Proverbs 10. You see it again. Something very similar. Proverbs 10, 25. The whirlwind connected with destruction, distress, and anguish of the wicked. Go to Proverbs 10. I'll give you the blank here in a minute after we read Proverbs 10, 27. Uh, I'm sorry, 10, 25. 10, 25. As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. So the whirlwind is not only the presence of God. Folks, the whirlwind, and particularly that verse 25, it's a reminder and a picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 25, as the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. Okay, they're gone. The Lord takes care of them. But who's left in verse 25? Who do you see there? The righteous is an everlasting foundation. When Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, he takes care of the evildoers and the wicked, right? But the righteous will be reigning and ruling with him for a thousand years down here. 
So a whirlwind is the presence of God, picture of the presence of God, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So did y'all get that? Learn spiritual truth by studying the things that you see in God's creation. Now, the last one here is pretty easy. Go to Isaiah 1. Snow. What could snow teach me and you? What should we be reminded of when we see snow? Let's take a look at what the Bible says. Snow. Isaiah 1 verse 18. 118. This is God putting things in our path and showing us things in his creation so that we might learn spiritual truth when we see what the Bible says about those things. Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know what snow is a picture of, folks? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. You go to Revelation 1.14, you'll find the same thing. His, the head of his hair was white as snow. And you see white in connection with Jesus Christ. It's about his righteousness. So snow, a picture of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, um, next thing I have here, go to, go to Luke 7. Am I going too fast or are you all okay? Is it too much to swallow at one time here or are we all, we all right? I know I'm loading you up with a lot. This is one of those lessons that you'll probably need to go back and search through again and pick up some of the things you didn't get the first time. But go over to Luke 7. The, the last thing on this point I have here is physical conditions of people are wonderful teaching aids. So in your Bible, you have people with all kinds of different physical ailments, conditions. Look at Luke 7.22 and you find a bunch. Look at 7.22. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. You got six kinds of people there. An infinite variety. You've got the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the dead, and the poor. Now, in this present age we live in, the church age, there's no guarantee of physical healing, right? However, there is a guarantee of spiritual healing. And did you know that physical conditions, these very same things you see in the Gospels and all through your Bible, physical conditions represent Spiritual conditions. Physical conditions represent spiritual conditions. Everybody in here, I would be willing to guess, everybody knows somebody who is spiritually blind right now. Yeah? 2 Corinthians 4 says, The God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of them that believe not. You know somebody not saved? They are spiritually blind. Is there a cure? Oh, yes, the Lord Jesus Christ. I bet that you know people who are spiritually deaf. They, if you were to try to read a verse of them, they would say, I don't want to hear that. They'd just run away. Stop preaching to me. And they refuse to hear the truth. Spiritual deafness. Can that be cured? Oh, yeah, the word of God penetrates the ear, the heart. Oh, yeah, it can get, get in there and, and make a change. How about spiritual lepers? You know, lepers in the Bible, they had to have their own colony. And the reason why is because they would infect other people. Did you know that sinners infect other people? Did you know that? There are people that because of the sin they're living in and they're around other people, they infect other people with their sin. You and I got to be watch out for that too. I know that we're saved, but we still live in this flesh. You got to be careful about that. But there's a cure for leprosy. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about spiritually. And we could go on and on there. Hey, everybody was born into this world spiritually dead in trespasses and sins, right? Is there a way to be alive? Yeah, be born again. There's life in Jesus Christ. So an infinite variety of people, all different kinds, but they're pictures of spiritual conditions. So the last thing I have on this section, this is really neat. Miracles of healing. And you notice that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that does the healing here in the Gospels for the most part. Miracles of healing are always a picture 
of what God wants to do, wants to do to those who are spiritually impaired. So you might not see physical healing like you'd like to see, although God can do that. But God is in the business right now of spiritual healing, and it doesn't matter the condition. Jesus Christ is the great physician. Amen? There's not a spiritual ailment he can't fix, that he can't cure. So there's uh, some things about non-living things. Now, we'll wrap up. We'll have some fun with this. And I may have to just give you these blanks. Uh, may not be able to look at all the verses, but uh, I want to make sure we don't spend too much time here. Let's go to the first thing here. I have biblical botany. Y'all study botany in school? Whether you knew it or not, you did. You might have slept through it because it's an easy class to sleep through. Botany is the study of plants. So uh, my first year, my freshman year of uh, college, I took a semester of botany and a semester of zoology. And I remember particularly the zoology textbook because I'm really into animals, not so much into plants. I remember getting that textbook, that zoology textbook, and being really excited about all the things I was going to learn about animals. That professor was the most boring professor out of all the professors I had in college. I had a bunch. He's top three. There's, there's, there's two I can think of at the top of my head. I could probably think of another, but he's top three most boring. He made learning zoology and botany no fun at all. I did not look forward to the class. <laughs> but when you look at these things biblically, there's so many neat things to learn. So, biblical botany, the plant kingdom, teaches us spiritual truth. Go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Probably familiar with this passage, but take a look at it and see what I'm talking about when it comes to the Bible and botany. Remember, God made things in his physical creation to teach me and you about spiritual things. So look at the first verse. Psalm 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So there's some spiritual things mentioned in the first two verses. And watch how God illustrates in verse 3. And he shall be like a tree who is compared to a tree in this case it's the righteous man the blessed man so the first thing i have here is trees illustrate men or if you want to put people trees illustrate people both men and trees have some things in common so here's what i put on that little little uh unfilled bullet point there the circle that's not filled in both men and trees have a crown. Did you know the top of your head is called a crown? Anatomically speaking, the top of your head's a crown. You know what the top of a tree is called? The crown. The top of the tree, uh, from a botanist perspective, is called the crown. Uh, I also have, and so do you, from my neck to my waist, what do we call this on a person? Trunk. Trees have trunks? Sure do. And the last thing I had here, and there's more than this, I just put three of them down. Crown, trunk, and what do you call arms and legs? Limbs. Trees have limbs? See, you have more in common with a tree than you thought, don't you? Now, the last thing I put here on trees is some trees, like some people, bear fruit. While other trees, like some people, do not. Now, you want to be a tree, like a tree that bears fruit, what fruit are you supposed to bear as a saved person? What kind of fruit is that? The fruit of the Spirit. Those are things that are going to come out of you as you walk with God. God brings those spiritual fruits out. So if you go to the Matthew passage, you know what the Lord says? You know this passage. The Lord Jesus Christ says, every tree is known by his fruits. The Lord himself used trees to illustrate spiritual truth. That's that Matthew 7 passage. Okay, so there's trees. Now, how about, and there's a whole lot more on plants. I just put some things to whet your appetite here. How about biblical zoology? Z-O-O-L-O-G-Y. That's the study of animals. Now, here's a, a, a full, you know, we can go a couple hours on this one, but i just give you a few things here. Animals. God made animals to teach us spiritual truth. Now, how many got animals at home? We got a little rodent and we got two cats. 
And there are things about those animals that teach me almost every day. I'll, I'll tell you the first thing that comes to mind. If you have animals, I, I, almost on a daily basis, I look at those animals in awe of who God is for making them. We have two beautiful cats. And I look at those cats and Sharon and I say almost on a daily basis, man, God made, God made her so pretty. God made him so pretty. Look how God made this. Look how those colors are. The hand of God is evident all over the animal kingdom. If you just take the time to observe it, Sharon and I love going to zoos and uh, Lord willing, we're going to go to one of the famous ones here um, uh, sometime soon, the San Diego Zoo. We're trying to plan a trip out there to see that one because that's supposed to be a really good one. We went to one in Colorado here a couple years ago. We love zoos because I love looking at God's hand in the animal kingdom. It's the neatest thing. All, is God created for what? Look at all the different sizes of animals. Look at some of the weird looking, the duck bill platypus. What a strange little creature. But what an awesome creature he is. Uh, you, you go to um, the Brevard Zoo. They got those pink flamingos. Y'all ever see those? How those things get pink? They eat salmon. And it actually changes their color. It's the neatest thing. God made animals to be so that we would look at them and be in awe of the one who made them. But let's go a little deeper. And there's things to learn about animals spiritually. So the first one I have here is birds. Birds often illustrate the spirit world. So over in Leviticus 11... The Lord gives you a list of clean birds and unclean birds as if the clean birds, they're the ones that you're okay to eat and the unclean birds not okay to eat. And I'll tell you, there's something dark about that list of unclean birds. You know what's in the list? I won't take you to Isaiah 34, but there's two in that list in Leviticus that are also there in Isaiah 34, the owl and the raven. Now, when you think of those two animals, do you think of light or darkness? I think of dark. Edgar Allan Poe, you ever have to read any of his stuff in school? He wrote this, this work of literature called The Raven, and it is as dark as could be. In fact, all that, that guy wrote, he was, uh, I think the, the, the devil had a real influence on that fellow, some of the stuff that he wrote. Very dark. But interesting how certain birds are connected with the spirit world. Now, let me show you a good bird here. You know what I'm going with this one. Go to Mark chapter one, Mark chapter one. I'll let you do your own study there on all those other birds, but that raven, that owl, that cormorant, man, they're not good. Connected with evil spirits appears to be. Now, I'm not saying that if you see an owl or if you see a raven, I'm not telling you that is an evil spirit. I'm not saying that. What I'm telling you is that spirits are similar. They're likened to birds. They can go from one place to another fairly quickly because how do they travel? Airborne, right? The spirit world. What is Satan? The prince of the power of the what? Of the air. So when you study birds, you're studying some things about the spirit world. Look at Mark 1. Now here's the spirit that you want to get really a good acquainted with. Look at Mark 1.10. This is Jesus' baptism. It says, in straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a what? A dove descending upon him. Now what comes to mind when you think of a dove? If you see a dove. Calm. Gentle. Flying through the air. Very, very smooth and um, majestic even. That's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is likened to a bird. You better believe that those unclean spirits can be likened to those unclean birds. There's something to learn there that... Uh, a whole lot deeper than I, than I even understand at this point in my life. I have to dig into that one day. But that's birds. Now, the next one, you're familiar with this one. Go to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. How about fish? What do fish teach us? Well, watch what the Lord says here. Matthew 4, 19. Matthew 4, 19. And he saith unto them. This is Jesus talking. Matthew 4, 19. He saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of... Man, you know what fish are a picture of? Lost people. Unsaved man. Fish, unsaved men. Now, it just so happens that some of those disciples that the Lord chose, what was their occupation? They just happened to be fishermen. You think they knew a thing or two about fishing? About how to catch fish? Oh, yeah. You know what the Lord said? The Lord said, listen, 
I know you're all in this business of catching fish and that's your livelihood. But I want you to take the things you know about catching fish and I want you to relate that to catching men. Let me give you some examples here. In fact, let me give you this blank and I'll give you some examples. Fishing and evangelism. Telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Fishing and evangelism have many parallels. I'll just, I'll just put it real plain here. If you want to win people to Jesus Christ, first of all, you got to go where there are people. If you want to catch a fish, you got to go where there are fish. You can spit, you could labor, get all the nice equipment and get the expensive bait and throw that fishing rod, throw that rod and reel, that uh, line out there into the, into the lake or the pond. And if there's no fish out there, you're not catching anything, are you? You better go where there's fish. You better go where the fish are biting. If you're going to evangelize, the first thing you want to keep in mind is you want to go somewhere where there's people you can talk to. Give me some examples of places. Uh, how about a busy downtown area like Orlando? Sometimes even I've been down to Cocoa Beach and it's real busy down there during tourist season. Spring break, all kinds of people down there. That's where the fish are. That's where you can get lots of gospel tracks out. That's where you're throwing the bait out so that maybe they take it and they say, hey, tell me more. See, it's a lot like fishing. Um, you also have to have, if you want to go fishing, you have to have the right kind of bait, right? Any old bait won't, won't work with just any old fish. You got to know what you're fishing for and have the right bait. What bait do you need as an evangelist? You need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's what you got to do. You got to explain to people sometimes why they need this bait that you've got. Because a fish will take bait because he thinks it's food and he wants the food. A person who's not saved will understand their need for what you've got, the gospel, and they'll take it if they understand their need for it. Now, the difference being we catch fish so we can eat them. You catch people so they can be saved. There is a difference there. So you can't go all the way to the end with the parallels, but there are similarities. You can't get around that or else the Lord Jesus wouldn't use that example. Fish are like lost men. Okay, I bet you if we brought a fisherman in here, I could interview him up here and he could teach us all kinds of things about evangelism in relating that to fishing. Be the, probably, we have to try to do that sometime. It'd be really neat. Okay, the next one here, oxen. What comes to mind when you think of an ox? Okay, yoke is one thing. And yoke makes so that oxen work as a team and they're by twos, Right? And it just so happens to be a piece of wood that connects the two together so they can work in tandem. How did Jesus send the disciples out? Two by two. They worked in tandem. So I'll let you look at these references here. Oxen are a picture of a ministry team. Now you can go out on your own to evangelize. You can go out on your own to minister to people. That's nothing wrong with that. But I'm telling you, if you've got a partner to back you up with prayer, and to be your support, it sure makes a difference. It's helpful, isn't it? So uh, oxen are a picture of a ministry team. And, and 1 Corinthians 9 talks about that. Working two by two. That's Mark 6. Tells you about the disciples being sent by twos. Yoked to a cross. And the reason I put that there is because a piece of wood is what connects those two oxen so they can go together. And what is it that connects me and you if we were to go out together to minister? It'd be the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, now here's what's really neat, man. Here's a neat thing to end on here, or get close to the end on. When oxen get to steep and rough places, guess how they keep moving? Anybody know the answer to this? What do they do in steep, rough places? They don't stop. They keep moving, albeit slowly. You know what they do? They get down. There you go, Miss Charlotte. They get down on their knees and move along on their knees. Is there something to learn there or what? When it gets rough and steep, get down on your knees. It sure is nice to have somebody right next to you who's on their knees as well. Amen? Come here Wednesday night. We got that opportunity. Really neat. All right. Last one here. Go to Job 11. Well, I promise we'll finish here. I'll wrap it up quickly here. Job 11. The wild ass. What's the wild ass picture? Let's make sure we get what the Bible says here. Job eleven twelve. Job eleven verse twelve. Job eleven verse twelve says, "For vain man would be wise, 
though man be born like a wild ass's colt. There's a song that got real popular many years ago called Born to be Wild. And there's some truth in that song because you know how a man is born? A wild man. You know how a wild man gets tamed? By the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you see an ass, now the thing about, the thing about an ass is uh, he's a burden bearer, isn't he? But he's also can be, he also can be very wild. And now an ox is not like that. You don't really hear about wild oxen. You hear about a wild ass though. So last thing I have on here, the wild ass picture of a lost man, a man who needs to be saved, needs to be tamed by Jesus Christ. If you go to Deuteronomy 22, you know what it says over there? And you read it and you're kind of, it's kind of unusual. But knowing what we've learned already, it makes sense. Deuteronomy 22, the Lord said this. He said, don't have an ox and an ass plow together. Do you know why God put that in there? Spiritually, a saved person, the ox, and an unsaved person, the ass, they can't get work done together. They can't. Because that unsaved person is oftentimes going to hinder the work of the saved person. So interesting, if you're going to go out two by two, it's a really good idea to go with somebody who's saved. Amen? So God put that little detail in there. When you're reading the Old Testament, you probably kind of scratch your head. And then you see this. and Oh, there's a picture there to be learned from. And that makes sense. So, folks, I went too long tonight. We could go on and on. The illustrative teaching of God's creation. Don't miss this week the opportunity to look at what God made. And then maybe just take one thing. You could take the sun. I didn't even talk about the moon tonight. There's a lot of neat things about the moon. You could take the moon. You could take trees. Any of these things. Pick your animal. Pick, a, pick, pick an animal and trace it to the scriptures. There's spiritual truth to be learned about those animals. If you'll look at them, learn about them physically, and then go to Bi the Bible and see what it says about them spiritually. So, hope you got something out of that. Let's pray together, and then we'll sing our song. Lord, thank you for your words again. We need them. The food, the spiritual food that is provided through your word is always nourishing. And I pray that our eyes be opened. I pray that we would see things that we have just failed to observe in, in recent days and weeks. In your creation, may we see things that you want us to learn from. And may it drive us to the scriptures to put the spiritual with the physical and learn more about the things that you made and learn more about ourselves. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.